Good afternoon and welcome to Matters Financial and Geopolitical from a frontier and thank you as always for stopping by. I hope the week has gone well. Let me start with some macro thoughts. The preeminent signal in the noise is the US dollar renminbi, um, which has now strengthened to below 7 versus the dollar um, and was last at 698 and change. And I've written about this severally. I wrote about the feedback loop phenomenon on the 13th of August. And I was quoting Tony Fratto, who said, we're in that bizarro world where you can be a currency manipulator if you fail to manipulate your currency. And I think he's got a valid point that the Chinese are manipulating that currency and in this case manipulating it into a below seven. Um, in, and uh, we, we traded it as low as 6.9796, not got that to that level since early August. Um, the renminbi shines in a bullish week as China markets embrace risk is a headline on Bloomberg. And as I've said, it is the most important currency to watch. 26th of August, at which point it depreciated 10% over 12 months. And I said it's being used as a shock absorber and a very precise responder to Trump. And the precision of the, of the response is seen in the recent rally. And I think more than anything, that's signaling to us that the Chinese do believe that they're coming to some kind of positive conclusion. Um, now let's move on to the US uh, to the global bond markets. The US 10-year bond, highest level since mid-September, trading at 1.88%. German 10-year yield at the highest since mid-July at minus 0.274%. The market ear, this is a US 10-year yield chart and the great trend. Now, I've written about this many times. 19th of August, I said safe havens are priced for Armageddon now, and now we're unwinding that Armageddon level pricing. Um, to wit, Marketeer says, boo, bond Armageddon, someone or something must have blown up. Gold, another safe haven, worst week in well over two years. That's from David Inglis. Uh, bond yield momentum continues to build. The German 10-year bond yield up to minus 0.29%, the highest level since mid-July. That's from JS Blockland. 24th of June, I was talking about these bond levels, and I called it a Wizard of Oz world. In each of these occasions, the wizard appears in a different form. Once as a giant head, a beautiful fairy, a ball of fire, and as a horrible monster. When at last he grants an audience to all of them at once, he seems to be a disembodied voice. Eventually it is revealed that Oz is actually none of these things, but rather an ordinary con man from Omaha, Nebraska, who has been using elaborate magic tricks and props to make himself seem great and powerful. And I said at that time, we were witnessing Wizard of Oz level moves in the markets, and we're now seeing those uh, being unwound. This is how a bond route looks like. Germany's 10-year yields have skyrocketed by 47 basis points to minus 0.25%. Japan's 10-year yields by 25 basis points. And in another article in June, I was speaking about how bond yields were in tilt mode. And at that point, I was saying markets and prices exhibit patterns of correlation. And essentially, my perspective is that it is the correlation that has exerted a pull effect on US yields. And therefore, the recessionary signaling of the yield curve, which was being signaled every day ad infinitum, should be discounted, which was a very uh, solitary opinion at the time. Um, so we're seeing a lot of that being unwound now, quite dramatic uh, movements in the markets. 
Home thoughts roads like this for hours on end and views better than dreams all the way to the Kenya-Ethiopia border in Moyale, the photos by Anwar via Kenya pics took me back to What's Your Road Man, Holy Boy Road, Madman Road, Rainbow Road, Guppy Road, any road, it's an anywhere road for anybody, anyhow, where, body, how. I like this photograph, Morgan, uh, this, this digital uh, uh, presentation, Morgan Whitney's Where You Gonna Be 2019, that's from the Saatchi Gallery. Blackfish, the problem of photographing orcas on the surface from a boat is simply the angle of view which is normally down and therefore horrid. This is from David Yarrow. The light this morning was perfect and there was enough swell for the cameras to almost be at surface levels at certain moments. My last article was at the moment of vision, the I see nothing. And, there, and then I discovered this fantastic photograph by Richard Waghorn. Le Figaro photograph from inside Notre Dame shortly before the roof collapsed as molten lead fell into the nave. I went back to a poem called Home by Warsan Shire. No one leaves home unless home is the mouth of a shark. You only run for the border when you see the whole city running as well. Your neighbours running faster than you, breath bloody in their throats. The boy you went to school with who kissed you dizzy behind the old tin factory is holding a gun bigger than his body. You only leave home when home won't let you stay. No one leaves home unless home chases you, fire under feet, hot blood in your belly. It's not something you ever thought of doing until the blade burnt threats into your neck and even then you carried the anthem under your breath, only tearing up your passport in an airport toilet, sobbing as each mouthful of paper made it clear that you wouldn't be going back. You have to understand that no one puts their children in a boat unless the water is safer than the land. No one burns their palms under trains beneath carriages. No one spends days and nights in the stomach of a truck feeding on newspaper unless the miles travelled mean something more than journey. No one crawls under fences, no one wants to be beaten, pitied, no one chooses refugee camps or strip searches where your body is left aching or prison because prison is safer than a city of fire and one prison guard in the night is better than a truckload of men who look like your father. No one could take it, no one could stomach it, no one skin would be tough enough. The go-home blacks, refugees, dirty immigrants, asylum seekers sucking our country dry. Niggers with their hands out, they smell strange, savage, messed up their country and now they want to mess ours up. How do the words, the dirty looks roll off your backs? Maybe because the blow is softer than a limb torn off, or the words are more tender than 14 men between your legs, or the insults are easier to swallow than rubble, than bone, than your child body in pieces. I want to go home, but home is the mouth of a shark, home is the barrel of the gun, and no one would leave home unless home chased you to the shore, unless home told you to quicken your legs, leave your clothes behind, crawl through the desert, wade through the oceans, drown, save, be hunger, beg, forget pride. Your survival is more important. No one leaves home until home is a sweaty voice in your ear saying, leave, run away from me now. I don't know what I've become. 
but I know that anywhere is safer than here. She is a very powerful poet. This is a lovely photograph of Wotamu in October via Will Knocker, who's by the seaside. And this is another seaside photograph from Howard French, happening now, Montego Bay. Political reflections. He, Rudy Giuliani, was always swirling around somewhere. The US ambassador to the European Union, Gordon Sontland, testified. Giuliani was ubiquitous on the phone with Ukrainian officials, inserting himself in US diplomatic meetings, sowing confusion and exasperation about what he was up to, witnesses said. Trump just kept saying, talk to Rudy, talk to Rudy, Sontland testified. If the use of Giuliani was to create some sort of plausible deniability, like in Iran-Contra, I don't think it works because it just doesn't make sense. And I take you back to December 2016 when I was touching on possible Russian interference in the US election. And I said there were two things. The second thing is non-linearity. You have to learn how to navigate a linear system in a non-linear way. And Giuliani was obviously uh, it's precisely that. Vice President Pence, I wrote over the weekend, is the coming man and this could happen real quick. And according to Reuters, and there's a short video, I've never heard any discussion in my entire tenure as Vice President about the 25th Amendment. He refutes the claim made by an anonymous former Trump official in his forthcoming book that he considered invoking the 25th Amendment to remove the President. My article on the 21st of October was about the new economy of anger and watch this, a sight to behold from Beirut, Lebanon. Women lead a candlelit march for change in downtown. That's from Joyce Cara. The noise you hear is pots and pans, exceptional time for the country, protests in week three. I said the phenomenon is spreading like wildfire in large part because of the tinder dry conditions underfoot. Prolonged standoffs eviscerate economies, reducing opportunities and accelerate the negative feedback loop. Antonio Gramsci wrote, the crisis consists precisely in the fact that the old is dying and the new cannot be born. In this interregnum, a great variety of morbid symptoms appear. Now is the time of monsters. A Hugh Muslim village was already turned into a shambles. The forced demolitions go all over the country. Short video. And China has unveiled a digital panopticon in Xinjiang. And I believe, as I wrote on the 21st of October, that the current modus operandi is running on empty. Human rights and anti-corruption activist Rafael Marquez and writer Sousa Jamba uh, were, received by the, were received and given Angolan presidential medals for their outstanding work in, to the benefit of the Angolan nation. Under the previous leadership, of course, these two were considered enemies of the state. That's Angola. Markets have now priced out rate cuts from the Fed into, uh, from the Fed into 2021. That's via David Inglis. Let's turn to the currency markets. Euro dollar 110.48. Dollar index 98.131. Japanese yen 109.27. Swiss franc 0.9946. The pound 128.11. The Australian dollar 0.6884. India rupee 71.32, South Korean won 11.5650, the real 410, Egyptian pound 16.1346, and the South African rand 14.7821. Dollar index at 98.13, has been firmer than I expected, and that's probably a function of higher US interest rates. Euro dollar, this is from FX Pit Titan. Last at 110.49. Sterling was also a chart from FX Peptitan, 128.11. The Bank of England was very dovish yesterday. 
Commodity markets, gold has had a torrid session. We're last at 1471.60. Uh, um, uh, the market here is asking, is it time to chase the laggards? Oil is the economy. I agree with them. I think WTI is headed to 60. The pork apocalypse speaks to a very fragile food situation I wrote on the 7th of October. And Charlie Robertson is saying, sales guys think I'm spending too much time thinking about bacon. But it's because China are among the world's biggest consumers. 88 pounds per capita, 40 kilograms per person. Why is China doing trade deals? Because swine fever has sent pork prices soaring and Chinese love eating pork. Canada's exports were cut to less than a million dollars a month due to disputes over the UA arrest should now rebound towards $1.5 billion a year. India's rupee slid in New York trading and stock futures fell from a record after Moody's lowered the nation's rating outlook to negative. Um, citing growth concerns, the reduction comes at a time when investors have been skeptical about the government meeting its budget targets amid a slowdown in tax revenues and September's surprise $20 billion tax giveaway for companies. It's fair to say that the currency will face significant brunt from the news, giving away some of the recent strength and maybe more. I won't be surprised if the rupee spikes back above 72 in coming days. Behold the Argentina 100-year bond and the Buenos Aires 2023 bond. And that really, you know, the oversubscription of the century bond really marked the overwhelming bubble we saw in the bond markets, which is now being deflated. Howard French has written, Why Africa's future will determine the rest of the world's the future of employment in Africa, where unprecedented demographic transitions are underway. Based on current projections, the continent's population of nearly 1.2 billion people will rise to 2.5 billion by the middle of this century, more than China and India combined. From there, it becomes harder to predict with any certainty, but Africa could very well have a staggering 4 billion people or more by 2100, according to the UN, meaning that the continent alone would account for more than a third of the human population. That is, be that is because how Africa's population evolves and how the continent's economies develop will affect nearly everything people near and far assume about their lives today. Europe, more deeply connected by history to Africa than most Europeans realize, positioned right on the continent's doorstep, will be the most dramatically affected. Latin America, which has become a surprising migration route for Africans hoping to reach the United States. Far away China, where an African community in the hundreds of thousands, estimated to be the largest in Asia, is centered in the city of Guangzhou. People from Africa are as much as a resource as humans anywhere. Europe today already faces its own stark demographic challenges, and they are precisely the opposite of Africa. Europe's crisis is one of falling birth rates, some of the lowest in the world, and an aging population. This demographic decline is already leading to shortages in the European labor market and other economic strains. This all comes back to jobs, and for good reason, Employment in Europe, North Africa, and even further afield will not be enough to meet the needs of Africa's burgeoning population. Employment in Africa is the most urgent challenge, Howard says. Some commentators pretend that China is in the process of industrializing Africa. This is largely a fantasy and an unhealthy one because it makes space for magical thinking about the continent's problems and thereby avoids serious focus on the daunting challenges at hand. Through no real fault of its own, China is mostly an obstacle to African industrialization. That's because China industrialized decades ago and now dominates with overwhelming advantages of scale most of the sectors that newly industrialized economies like those in Africa seek to enter. The practical solution for Africa threefold. First, agriculture, not industry, is the key to providing work for the hundreds of millions of Africans to come. 
In many African countries, more than 50% of the labor force already works in agriculture. In some states like Burundi and Burkina Faso, it is more than 80%. The continent's best bet is agriculture, modernizing agriculture, that's W. Hugh Moore, a former Liberian Minister of Public Works, um, a robust agricultural sector that begins to trade with other sectors of the economy will the, be the basis of a sustainable path to industrialization. It will provide food security, improve balance of payments as food imports decline. Second pillar is education. Um, uh, and, uh, Already in the United States, it is an unrecognized fact that Africans have the highest level of education of any immigrant group. Finally, Africa and its foreign partners must greatly accelerate ways to remove barriers that still hinder the movement of people, goods and capital. Uh, Europe's political imagination and economic will in forging new relations with Africa, ones based on belief in their common destiny, have been flagging since the Cold War. If Europe fails to engage the continent in much more transformative ways now, before the demographic momentum becomes overwhelming, it will have itself to blame. He was my guest on MindSpeak, the link is there, and there was a very fantastic presentation and a fantastic Q&A session. Please watch. Africa has a population boom and a younger workforce, but it needs to create an estimated 10 million new jobs each year. Almost 60% of Africans are younger than 25, compared with one-third in the US. This youth bulge could, could translate into an ample and energetic workforce, but the benefits accrue only when greater prosperity reduces fertility rates. If the next generation has fewer babies than their parents, the proportion of working age people would rise relative to the number of their dependents, mainly children and the elderly, creating a so-called demographic dividend. Nile Power set new deadline to end SPAT after Trump meeting, that's Egypt, Ethiopia and Sudan, set a Jan 15 deadline to reach an agreement on the uh, filling and operation of a giant Ethiopian dam on a Nile tributary after a US brokered meeting sought to ease rising tensions. Egypt and Ethiopia are struggling to reach an agreement on how to fill the reservoir a process crucial to ensuring a reliable flow to Egypt, which depends on the Nile for almost all of its fresh water. Increased U.S. role is a possible vindication for Egypt as Foreign Minister Sameh Shukri hailed the positive results of Wednesday's meeting and the clear and specific timetable set. Egypt and Ethiopia both have populations of about 100 million and are the fastest growing economies in their respective regions. Africa Confidential, Ethiopia Prize Fight, selected as Nobel Prize winner, uh, Abi faces mayhem in his home region. The structure under formation, whose working name is believed to be the Ethiopian Prosperity Party, would then discard the EPRDF's Leninist cladding and instead follow Abi's Medena Synergy Theory, a personal philosophy as enshrined in a book which he offers as a roadmap to Ethiopia's political future. Critics have called Medema an ideological mishmash coated in self-help evangelism. EPRDF is currently an alliance only in name. They say they're afraid that removing the constitu constituent members' regional identities would be the first step towards ending devolved ethnic self-rule, which is enshrined in the constitution. Perhaps more problematic for Abiy than and yet another TPLF gripe is the fact that his dream scheme has already aroused opposition in the most populous region, Oromia, nominally his home turf. Popular opposition from the second largest region, Amhara, despite formal support for the merger by the ruling EPRDF Amhara constituent party. Uh, recent events suggest the TPLF is unlikely to board the Abbey train. Increasingly spiky Abi made the doctrinal dispute personal in October by saying at the launch of the book Medema, if someone is not satisfied with the Medema idea and has another idea called Mebazat, let him put it down his whiskey and write a book. The mayhem showed how deep-rooted ethnic nationalism is and how removed Abi is from his own constituency. 
The dark backdrop to the drama of remaking the EPRDF is the rising tension between the aroma and Amhara, which could spread into a sustained conflict if not managed carefully. Government is set to propose two new medium-range economic plans to Parliament after the election slated for May 2020. Um, I've been quite fulsome in my praise for him. I said the 90 or so days, well that was after he'd been in power, just for 90 days, represent the most consequential arrival of an African politician on the African stage since Mandela walked out of prison blinking in the sunlight and constructed his rainbow nation. But he faces, I said, a fiendishly complicated task fending off the centripetal forces which are tearing Ethiopia apart. Vice President Pence, who is an evangelical Christian, is in the habit of praying with uh, Abbey allegedly. Money is accordingly a system of mutual trust and not just any system of mutual trust. Money is the most universal and most efficient system of mutual trust ever devised. Cowrie shells and dollars have value only in our common imagination. Their worth is not inherent in the chemical structure of the shells and paper, or their colour or their shape. In other words, mind isn't a, money isn't a material reality. It is a psychological construct. It works by converting matter into mind. Here I saw a tweet from Mawarire, getting familiar with your new currency from the RBZ. Africa Confidential again, South Africa, where's the plan? The sense of a return to the Mandela spirit in the wake of South Africa's 32-12 victory over England in the Rugby World Cup final has quickly come up against economic realities as harsh as those in the worst years of the apartheid regime. Centre stage is the contradiction between the trade union's calls for a macroeconomic stimulus targeted spending to create jobs and growth and the Treasury's advocacy of microeconomic reforms that would involve restructuring many of the state-owned enterprises, commercialization and privatization. There is, of course, a new sex position called the Ramaphosa, get on top and do nothing. Adrian Basson, the rainbow nation reloaded, let's not mess it up again. The Springboks have revived the much maligned concept of South Africa as a rainbow nation with a historic Rugby World Cup championship victory on Saturday. It's a second chance given by Springbok captain Sia Kulisi, coach Rassi Erasmus and the team who emphasised the idea of one nation working together after its stunning win over England. I've written about the Nelson Mandela 1994 mood, it's unforgettable, he walked out of prison blinking in the sunlight and constructed his rainbow nation. Here you see an image of Khaleesi standing at the summit of the Rugby World Cup as South Africa's first black captain shows in some part that the dream of racial cohesion is still alive. South African all shares up 9% year to date, dollar rand 14.7825, still in that 14.50. 1550 range. Egyptian pound really one of the top performers this year at 16.1357. EGX 30 up 13.5% year to date. Nigeria all share down 16.68% year to date. Ghana Stock Exchange uh, down 13.52% year to date. Look at this uh, video of landings in other parts of South Sudan. Nothing compares to this view of what is normally busy Paibor town. That's from Chris Trott. President Kenyatta signed into law the Finance Bill, uh, among other provisions, repeals Section 33B of the Banking Act that provides for the capping of bank interest rates. Rate cap gone, but Eurasia Group sees Kenya IMF facilities still far off. An agreement is n now only likely by the end of next year. Previously, we underestimated the fiscal slippages program hinges primarily on Kenya's fiscal trajectory and specifically the ability of the Kenyan authorities to commit to deeper revenue consolidation. That's Goldman Sachs. Government's decision last month to shift Kenya's debt limit to $86 billion rather than have it as a percentage of GDP has also raised concern that the state plans to ramp up borrowing. Debt stands at almost 60% of GDP higher than the 50 percent threshold. Eurobonds, however, have rallied. Um, 2024 Eurobond is at 5.22 percent. 30-year bond is at 7.72 percent. 
um, under conditions for a previous $1.5 billion arrangement that expired in 2018, Kenya was required to reduce its fiscal gap to about 3% of GDP by 2022. The deficit widened to 7.7% in the year through June, above a target of 6.8%. The shilling has strengthened to 102.75. Good source of dollars, mostly from the banking stocks on the stock exchange, uh, said as a trader to Reuters. NSC has jumped to a 14-month high. Safaricom and the banks driving that. Safaricom share movement has a huge bearing on the overall market performance. It accounts for 49% of the NSC's market value. And that, if you include the banks, it's 79.8%. Banking stocks, absolute return this year. KCB, 40.85%. Equity Bank, 39.89%. NCBA Bank 32.73%, Housing Finance 32.49%, Stanbic 21.21%, Barclays 19.18%, Co-op Bank 10.84%, Standard Chartered 8.1%, DTB the Laggard minus 23.48%, the Nairobi All Shares up 17.9%, NSE 20s down 3.05%. And with that, I wish you a tremendous weekend.